Welcome to Subtext and Discourse. I'm your host, Michael Dooney, co-owner and director of Berlin-based gallery Jarvis Dooney. As 2019 draws to an end, we have a couple more interviews with the participants of our second postcard salon, which took place at the beginning of this year. Back in July, I met up with Louise Crawford and Stefan Granu, an artist couple from Scotland and France, respectively. We speak about their series 36 Related Objects, their love of large format analogue photography, and the inevitable transition to a digital workflow. So without further delay, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Louise and Stefan. So this series that you did, that we've included in the postcard salon, Mm -hmm. this is a documentation of all your equipment, is that right? Yes. Yeah. That's right. Well, when I was looking through your back catalogue, this is probably the most typological work that you've done, because a lot of other things are more... I mean, there's the early experimental sound and video work, and then a lot of other ones are more environmental or experiential, they're over there within a space. Like, did you want to talk a little bit about this series and how you came to it? And then we can maybe have a look at some of your early ones, like mm-hmm. with the one second recordings and like all of these other um, kind of interesting projects that you've worked yeah. on. I suppose was the first time we started working in that way of uh, doing a larger series of photographs. I don't think we thought about it as a typology mm-hmm. at, at that point. And we certainly didn't think that it would continue into other works, for example, the one second recording. Or oh, so this was before? This is before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. kind of. Yeah. The one second recordings actually aren't finished yet yeah. because there are, well, 700 records and rising because Stefan yeah. keeps buying. Yeah, there's <laughs> <laughs> no, about, yeah, no, 700, yes. yeah, 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 maybe a bit more. Yeah. Because it's all vinyl, isn't it? It's, it's all, all vinyl. vinyl. Yeah. It's our, our, yeah. Yeah. I have listened to some of the ones on SoundCloud. They're quite. Yes. I think when I read when you read the description of it, you think this must be really chaotic, but somehow it's it somehow it works actually. Listening to the recordings, they're really quite pleasant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose yeah. so. The idea is always you say well, you always state you know it's one second of each recording, and it could be one random second of mm-hmm. each record, but in fact. Uh, we do kind of listen to the record and we kind of pick up, mm-hmm. you know, what sounds uh, seems more suitable for the piece. So, uh, so it doesn't create also a kind of chaotic uh, editing as well, yeah. even though we're not going to edit the piece. But um, so sound that kind of could be quite pleasant and not that kind of the, the cut wouldn't be, you know, out of place. Somewhere. Yeah. I think also we were avoiding sounds or voices, Mm -hmm. the the singing voice, or something where you would identify the song immediately so that it didn't sound like, um, I remember a television television program called Name That Tune and you had, you know, the first (laughs) bars of the music. So it was to avoid that Mm -hmm. and um, pick up probably something instrumental, so outside of the voice, and something that was you wouldn't immediately identify with it. So the 36 related objects, suddenly there was an, well, there was another group of, um, or series of sound pieces, um, the, the one second pieces. Now we're starting to photograph the plants mm-hmm. and we did a series of screen prints in April, which are based on photographs of the film boxes that went to make up our films. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming, there's various groups of work um, almost under the same theme or becoming Mm -hmm. a kind of (laughs) gizant. Yeah, well it's almost like an archive of everything that you've done or an archive of your process really. Yes, Mm -hmm. yeah. And this just to, maybe just to rewind a bit, I think the whole thing started when we had been filming on 16mm, mm-hmm. making a film in Berlin 92. Uh, in 92, so this is quite a long time ago. And at that point we were um, interested in you know, the traces of the wall and the difference in the city and could you actually, were they visible? How did it feel when you were navigating through east and west? Did you feel the changes? It was a bit of an uh, uh, independent, experimental jump cut mm-hmm. uh, film that had short scenes and uh, bits of music. It's only seven minutes long. So we filmed that 
And then sometime later, so maybe about 13 years later, we went back to the scenes that we'd already filmed. And it was almost, so that was the point we were self-referencing uh, self our own work. It was just a way of getting back into work, actually. That's why we did that when we went back to those different scenes. It was a way of going back out into Berlin and saying, mm -hmm. okay, is there anything that's interesting here? Where shall we start? Or when you say getting back into work, you had a break or? We well, were in Berlin. We were in Berlin. 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 Yeah. So it was maybe coming back into the city and trying to connect with the city and thinking about, shall we do work again in the city or not? It was a way of just asking those questions. Yeah. So we went back to those scenes and we photographed um, the different scenes. And somehow out of... The same frame we had in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, and somehow out of that... Um, this idea of looking back to what you'd done before and by extension looking back at our at all our cameras um, and equipment mm -hmm. and with the change to digital everything kind of fell in place that we thought okay well, let's start photographing all this uh, all this equipment I think other people you know sometimes things are in the air as well and other yeah. people had been had been doing that and um, it was also a, a time where we bought several pieces of equipment and film when we were living in, in Budapest. Mm -hmm. So we had objects that were coming from the former East and, and film from the former East as well that we really, really liked the different colour palette. And we had been using those films, more in film than photography, mm -hmm. uh, but we loved the different grain and the, the, the different colour. A different range of colours. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I noticed that when I looked through some of your earlier works, like there's a certain blue hue, or well, there's like some of the, mm. the colours are typical for photographers working in that region. Did you start working with film then? Because when I, yeah, you just mentioned that you had the film from 1992. Was mm -hmm. that the first time that you worked together? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, when we started collaborating, it was very much on punctual collaboration on film only and we had our own practice on our side on the side and then it's only later on about 10 years later that mm -hmm. we started collaborating full time with mainly photography but still still with the idea of the film because that's where we started with you know and, yeah and so the, the first photo we did had we were trying to kind of bound the photo with a kind of relation well bound with the cinema or with this idea of time mm -hmm. within the frame. So you both really came together as filmmakers almost? Um, I would say artists using... Yeah. Artists using artists film, using, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, and that I was wondering about actually, because you're from Scotland and you're from France, how did this begin? Well, that's in Budapest. We happened to be there at the same time and we had the same kind of uh, scholarship, which was kind of those exchange between country which were set up just after the war, the fall of the war or okay. roughly in that region in the early nineties nineties, when the kind of you know, the kind of the Western countries uh, were trying to um, make contact with Eastern European countries. So the, the the a way to do that was through student exchange. Mm -hmm. And so we had a, um, we got a residency program which um, was a kind of set up with a different government with the uh, Ministry of, for, uh, of, of Culture in Budapest. So oh, okay. We had the money from the Ministry of Culture in Budapest, but we applied through, um, in my case, the Minister des Affaires étrangères, the Foreign Office, and it's through the British Council. Yeah, the British Council. Yeah. yeah. And were you in Budapest for long after that? Uh, for one year. For one year. They were, they were one year residency. And, but it was, you said it wasn't two years later that you consciously decided, let's just collaborate with one another, like as a duo, so to say. Well, after they went back both to our uh, respective country, um, uh, we had an opportunity to participate in, a, in an exhibition in Edinburgh, which was uh, celebrating the European Submit for um, the European Submit in Edinburgh. And there was a call for artists to collaborate with other European artists. Mm -hmm. So that's when Louise called me and said, you know, would you like to do a collaboration 
for this project and we decided to do a film. When we met in Budapest, we had, um, we did do some filming of um, letters, mm -hmm. I remember. We were kind of playing around and doing some animation and some, mm -hmm. some Super 8 uh, filming together or, or Double 8 as <laughs> possible. <laughs> So, because some of your other work, I guess the one that I'm most familiar with is your photographic work. When mm -hmm. was the, was it a gradual shift away from the moving image to the still image, or do you still like work predominantly with film? I don't think we, we don't work predominantly with it, but it comes back. Yeah. Um, for example... Every so often. Every so often um, we do uh, a film piece, I'm trying to think of, the, probably 2010 was the, the last um, film piece, which is for um, two, two screens. At, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was shot on Gave Chrome, so it was shot on old 16, on 16 millimeter um, outdated film mm -hmm. that gives it this very particular uh, uh, color quality that we processed ourselves and then it got transferred onto video and exists as, as a, a double video projection. Okay. So. Have you, um, seeing as a lot of your early work is so grounded in all of these, I guess now obsolete technologies, <laughs> yeah. has, is it becoming more and more difficult to remain faithful to that or do you have to start using digital? I think it's becoming increasingly difficult, I suppose, because... Um, like for film stocks and things yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, film stock are disappearing, mm -hmm. chemicals are disappearing. Lots of labs have closed down as well, so... Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose now what happened is that uh, lots of close, uh, labs closed down, but, you know, some keen uh, filmmakers have taken, recuperated the, the, the machines and set up their own land. So there's lots of structures, kind of um, self-sufficient structure, like associations and things like that, that can process films now. So oh. it's still possible to do that. There's, there's, you know, almost in every city there's um, such a structure like that. There's one in Berlin called Film Labor. Mm -hmm. I think they're in Vedding. In Paris, there's one called La Bounam. That's where we process the, the, the last... Um, oh, okay. The give a cool, uh, stock. So there are still possibilities, but still, yeah. I mean, you know, like for example, the give a cool stock we found it in a flea market once. Oh, you right. Know, okay. of, um, I mean, it was a, a flea market devoted to cinema and photography, mm -hmm. analogic um, um, cinema and photography equipment, but still, you know, it was kind of. Yeah, that was kind like, of a, a chance mm -hmm. discovery, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. And I think we're aware of that working on. This, with the still image, with the large format camera, that perhaps this, this the series that we're doing at the moment on the with the plants, it's possibly going to be the last series on um, analog large format. Oh really? Do it's just because we work on reversal that oh, we need right, yeah. uh, we need the Polaroid. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the, the Polaroid, that's the sticking <coughs> point actually, we need the Polaroid to check the light mm -hmm. and uh, we can't get hold of Polaroid anymore. Either we find a way with the digital, we have a digital uh, camera of trying to check the light yeah. and working that way because if we, it's too expensive to bracket 5 by 4 films. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. <laughs> Oh, we um, move into negative. I mean, but we have to think yeah. about a serious shift here. Yeah, yeah, because I've noticed as well with different <coughs> formats that five by four, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to be as popular. Or well, there aren't as many mm. uh, enthusiasts keeping it going. Like mm. the eight by ten, it does seem that there's a kind of a thriving yes. community. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, with the medium format, and still people are hanging on to mm. thirty-five millimeter. But I remember thinking, oh, if I was going to dabble with large format, mm. 5 by 4 seems to be the least um, accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, is strange because then on, in terms of large format it's probably the cheapest because the 8 by 10 is really expensive mm -hmm. and you really have to be absolutely spot on with your <laughs> yeah. light when you're using an, a reversal, 
reversal stock. Is there a reason for using the transparencies instead of negatives? I think it was out of um, practicality at first because it was you had an image, an image so you could we could check. Mm -hmm. and we also really liked the the, the quality of it. Um, and I suppose we never got used to work with uh, eggs. Mm -hmm. um, just habit. Mm -hmm. Just, just yeah. habit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our practice has evolved throughout the years because before we were doing um, analog prints, mm -hmm. um, at some stage we couldn't, well, it's not that we couldn't anymore, but we had to shift yeah. you know, towards lambda print and now uh, it's more like inkjet print. So we still do analog images, but we kind of scan. Um, the, the, the tranny um, to, to have a kind of digital print. Yeah. So all the prints are digital somehow. Oh, right, the final print is. The final print okay. is. Final print. Because I noticed on your um, website as well, there were ones with a duotone print, or there was, a, there was one that looks, almost looks like a dot matrix print uh, or something like that, like yeah, the old newspaper prints, it looks like. They have a, a half tone. That's added. it, half tone. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, that was very complicated. We did it. Uh, we've been working with the same printer for years. Mm -hmm. um, he's in Glasgow uh, because he works just for artists. Um, so it's a real privilege to have mm -hmm. somebody who works just for artists and he works incredibly well. And um, yeah, I think we were really testing his patience. <laughs> <laughs> We were adding it. I mean, it was added, you know, on Photoshop. Every time the the prints were different sizes mm -hmm. as well. So every time you change the scale, it had an effect on the the half oh, tone because we wanted the half tone the same size. Yeah. <laughs> so um. Or roughly the same proportion. Roughly yeah. the same mm -hmm. proportion, but uh, yeah, but it worked. But just. But I suppose um, it was a way. This this half tone thing was a way to introduce this idea of archiving as well. Yeah. You know, like a. I suppose printed image uh, from newspaper that becomes document. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that was a link at first. Mm, yeah. Yeah, especially when you were dealing with um, photographs where you want to say something about a past, where an event has happened or you're talking about a historical event. Um, the idea was to add this half tone to make reference mm -hmm. to not necessarily a news event, but a historical event. And that was the case when we did the photographs of <clears throat> in Berlin of where the tunnels had been under the wall and we were just photographing overground and we placed our camera um, where the tunnel had started um, facing west and where the tunnel finished facing east mm -hmm. so and um, we decided we'll put a half tone on those okay mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess because a lot of your projects do reference the past and mm. specific locations and events. Mm. What is your, or how do you start? Mm. Like you were saying about the plants, which was a, um, kind of the next step from doing the 36 objects. Mm. And that came out of losing certain equipment and thinking mm. we can't use this anymore, but what mm. can we do with it still? Is it, are you tied like to a specific place? Because I guess you were saying about being in Edinburgh. You were based in Budapest, so you, did, you were in Budapest for doing the residency, but then you're sometimes in Berlin, but then sometimes mm -hmm. in Paris. Is there one specific place that you're tied to, or you're, you're working between them? We have been based, I would say, more based in Paris over the, ten, over the last 10, 10 yeah. to 15, <clears throat> yeah. 15 years. Yeah, I think there's always a relationship to the past, um, because it... it when you we actually started working together on photography, we started collaborating on photographs in two thousand, mm -hmm. and it was when we were in Paris and we didn't have a studio, and we thought, okay, we just need to go out and do some work. We thought, let's go out maybe at night. Maybe I thought, well, I don't really fancy prowling in Paris <laughs> <laughs> with a big camera. That's <laughs> maybe not advisable. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> it was it was a way of discovering the city as well at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. kind of trying to have a grasp of the city. Mm -hmm. And Stefan had been already been doing a lot of night shots, so I kind of hooked into his work okay. actually. But was it the first time you'd lived uh, in Paris? Yes. Okay. Yeah, as well. So that's really how the collaboration on um, with photographs uh, started, and there there wasn't. 
there wasn't really, I think there's a way of, you know, looking at where you are in your present. Sometimes you look into the past, mm -hmm. especially in Berlin when you were out in the city and sometimes in some other places, but you look and there's some things that just don't fit together and it encourages you to, uh, you know, to look back into the past. To, um, to understand the topography that you're, you know, you, that's in front of you. But I think we're also big, um, you know, we love flea markets, you, you know, we love looking at old objects, not necessarily old, but just used things that other people have owned and, mm -hmm. um, or old postcards, which is also you know, things, photographs that probably are of similar subject matter or similar interests, you know, in postcards we kind of gravitate to as well. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I suppose with the postcards it's also the, there's the tie with the, the plants somehow, or yeah. it's just once, you know. We found in a, a collections of um, plants, well, postcards of plants, which were from the GDR. Mm -hmm. And we really liked the quality of them. They were black and white, they were very simple, but yet they were quite well constructed. And I guess, you know, there's a tradition of postcards, especially in Germany, with um, plants for various occasions, you know, like Christmas or Easter. Really? Um, well, because I've noticed after, you know, when we started looking for more postcards, I went through different flea map trying to find those um, black and white ones. But I found some coloured ones, so obviously from West Germany, and some of them have, you know, um, fire, uh, fire in Austin or, you know, really? like Easter or um, Merry Christmas or things like that. So I think there's this kind of, there must be in Germany a specific kind of subject matter related to plants and, well, religious kind of moment like Christmas and Easter, I guess. But, which is, in the case of DDR, I wouldn't fit too much because <laughs> yeah, they're exactly. not really kind of, you know, onto religion. Um, but I suppose they were maintaining some kind of tradition of, you know, those kind of plants. Um, and I suppose also we have lots of plants in Paris. And I suppose that's how it came about. Also the idea that we might leave Paris and then we'll have to leave the plants behind. So it was a, a way of also um, kind of cataloging our plants that yeah. we're going to leave behind. So and cataloging a, a way, a part of our life, basically. Yeah. So, um, I think also as well, not wanting to let things go. Like I know mm -hmm. my wife doesn't like to throw things away. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, if you take pictures of everything, then I've still got I have a memory of it. I've got some, I have, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I still have a memento mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. that object. Yeah, and no, losing it completely. Mm -hmm. yeah. With the plants, are you shooting them the same way as the 36 objects? Or are you going to uh, put them in studio? <clears> the setting is more or less the same. Um, that is a kind of studio setting with mm -hmm. a backdrop. We are trying to do something slightly different. But um, I suppose with the 36 related object, it started as a, almost like um, a typology, mm -hmm. but very quickly uh, we shift the camera around and we started uh, cutting the objects, changing the frame. And so quite quickly the objects were not, you know, right in the middle of the frame. Exactly, yeah, they're not the typology like they were, in a classical yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And as a friend of ours uh, told us, we were kind of failed conceptual artists in that regard. But what was interesting is that he said we were doing some kind of um, portraits, family portraits. Oh, uh, yes. Because we had such a strong relationship with those objects, we couldn't be completely detached with them. And that's how we started framing them and, you know, arranging the, the, the image. I suppose with the plants, we're a bit less in that kind of perspective. It's, well, so far, um, they've been more like um, in the middle of the frame mm -hmm. um, type of. I think with the plants, the um, accent will be more on the light and okay. the, the use of light. But we've been working, I mean, we've just started, so sometimes it takes a while to um, uh, to get into the series mm -hmm. uh, for the 36 related objects. Yeah, we were on the series for about five years and there were different phases mm -hmm. that it went through, so the depth of field suddenly we'd start playing with 
with that. So we're just at the beginning of the the plant series. Hopefully it'll be a bit quicker. Because <laughs> 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 we have to move. <laughs> but uh, we've been using the um, a mirror to uh, to sh to reflect light on the leaves. Oh, so nice. This, okay. So we're uh, using our, um, daylight, no, yeah, no yeah, artificial daylight, lights at yeah. all. Mm -hmm. And that sense of when you're, if you're in a garden or moving through a forest, the filtered light that comes through and then can just pick up um, <clears throat> parts of the leaf that you focus on. Yeah. So, um, so at the moment we're, you know, we're in that way of thinking about, about them or just... Um, yeah, mm -hmm. but you said you might not be staying in Paris or you've got to move or you don't, this is the just in case for making the plant series? Oh, no, we're no, we're not. Oh, you are moving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're planning to move and the next permanent base is going to be there. I hope you enjoyed listening to my conversation with Louise and Stefan. In the podcast description, I have linked to their website where you can learn more about their back catalogue of work and their practice in general. Hopefully you'll also have noticed something of an improvement in the audio quality. Though the recording situation could have been better, I have started working with a producer to improve the listening experience. So thanks to Sebastian De La Luz, who did the sound engineering of the interview component of the podcast. As always, I welcome any comments, questions or feedback to each episode, and you can stay up to date by following on social media at the links below. Thanks again for tuning in. My name is Michael Dooney, and you've been listening to Subtext and Discourse.